This is Talking With, Brian Lamb's conversation with historian Douglas Brinkley. Episode 14 starts after this. I noticed that you signed at least one of the two impeachment letters that historians signed, to, in other words, to impeach Donald Trump. I can't remember whether you did the video or not, but before Donald Trump even successfully won the presidency, a serious number of historians did videos saying, don't elect this man, he's a horrible person. Uh, why would a historian do that before the fact? I refrained from that during the campaign uh, when Trump ran. I was doing commentary for CNN, uh, trying to be as balanced you know, as you could covering it. I didn't sign on for the first impeachment with, um, with Russia and all of that. The second impeachment of Donald Trump was the one that I signed on. And um, I felt Trump's behavior after the election, after he lost, was abominable. Uh, the fact that you refuse to recognize that you lost, to uh, put our court system through all of this, to spread lies and innuendos. You could feel that we were heading to January 6th by Trump's behavior. And incidentally, Trump cost Republicans a lot for that behavior. I mean, they very well may have won in Georgia, uh, but Trump's telling his own base that votes don't count. It's rigged in Georgia, allowing two Democrats to take over the Senate. So he was untethered, Trump. Uh, he was, um, you know, really, I felt from November till the January, um, he, he was just, the, the thought of losing was impossible for him to process. You know, Donald Trump has a code, and it came out of uh, kind of Roy Cohen, uh, but and, and the code is, as you know, and everybody knows, never say you're wrong, never admit defeat. And he talks, Trump, about his gamble with history. And his gamble is to follow his code. And if you're Donald Trump, he says, everybody says I'm, I'm wrong, but here I am sitting in the White House. My code had got me that far. I never ran for any public office yet I'm president of the United States with everybody telling me I'm wrong. For, and so losing for Trump to Joe Biden, who he had already earmarked as the worst, weakest candidate in, in American history, to lose to Biden, it, 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 it was and is something he can't process. Um, psychologically can't process. Let me though, stick with the, the historian thing. I can remember back when David Halberstam participated in the Democratic National Convention. I can remember when Bob Carroll, I think, introduced Ted Kennedy at one of the Democratic conventions. I can certainly remember just recently when John Meacham had been writing speeches for Joe Biden during the campaign didn't tell the audience on MSNBC. MSNBC let him go. So they must have thought that that was stepping over the line. Well, I'm not allowed to do it with CNN. But why are historians feeling the need to be on a side when they are historians? Well, it's a good question because people are not just, hist you know, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, uh, the great existentialist French philosopher, used to say, I'm not a waiter. Uh, and, and uh, meaning I'm not just my job. I have all sorts of, you know, of, of emotions and feelings. So you have to rank where your civic responsibility kicks in on something. If you see an evil or you see something that's threatening the democracy, you've got to speak up. And in, um, in the case, though, of writing, you know, like we, we were suggesting uh, with, with Meacham or others. CNN would not let me. They said, where you, you can't be presidential historian if you uh, are working for the Biden administration. And they made it very clear. Rebecca Cutler, the uh, head of um, contributors at CNN, I had an opportunity to do an event where I would moderate in the campaign, an event with I thought was reasonable to have me as moderator. It was like John Kerry and Leon Panetta and they, but they were Democrats for Biden, and yet they were former secretaries of defense and secretaries of state. All they wanted to be to moderate great people in American history to be the historical moderator. And I was told, no, you can't, you can't moderate that because it's a Democratic Party event. Um, 
But when I want to have my own view on something, personally, if I want to say, uh, you know, we need to have a, a climate core to fight climate change, I'm allowed to say what I think um, personally, but I can't get involved with that party game. But I don't know whether you agree with this or not, but <clears throat> people who watch CNN or MSNBC or Fox have absolutely no problem understanding where they're coming from. People that watch CNN think they're left of center. People watching MSNBC, left of center. Fox, right of center. And therefore, to, I mean, that didn't used to be the case. At least people didn't admit it. What about that? Why I, has that happened? And do you believe it has happened? It has happened. Um, it's very hard to be neutral in this society right now. It's very hard to navigate a centrist course. And part of it is that it's not always right, left, liberal, conservative. I believe most Americans have mixed opinions. They're, they're, they shop ideas from a lot of different places. They end up with a candidate. But, you know, there are many people who voted for Donald Trump who despised, they could tell you five things they hated about Trump. And people that voted for Biden have reasons they don't like them. Um, I think, though, we just become more polarized. Everything's become political. I mean, look at, look at NBA or Major League Baseball. Look at company boycotts. Um, you know, it's, that's the age we're living in right now. So for somebody like me, I just try to put my head down, go straight ahead, try to do my history work. I don't write about current events in my history books. I'm writing in that period. But as a human being, sometime you have to go out of a box. For example, I'm just deeply concerned right now about, uh, I think it should be a global issue about our oceans becoming garbage dumps. So if somebody wants me to sign a letter about keeping the oceans clean and getting the plastics and poisons out of the ocean, I'm going to sign it. That's a political statement because you're not having the head of uh, the people dumping, dumping the plastics, you know, signing that letter. But it means too much to me morally, spiritually to ignore it. Donald Trump, why were you called before he took office between the election and the inauguration? Who called you and why did you go spend time with him at Mar-a-Lago? Um, I did CNN. Uh, that gives you an idea. I was trying to be a, a straight historian with Hillary Clinton versus Donald Trump. Um, I wrote the introduction to Jake Tapper's book that CNN did for that, you know, campaign. Um, and I was got a call um, from a, a friend who knew that I was going to Florida and said, do you want to come meet President Trump? This is not unusual. Um, this uh, in the sense of that period, I was historian at CNN. Um, Trump despised CNN at that point. Uh, but, you know, I'm a minor person and all of that noise going on out there. And most people, once they're president-elect, do want to meet people. They, they, it's just, you know, he was meeting Leonardo DiCaprio on climate change and, you know, uh, uh, Robert Kennedy Jr. on vaccines. And, I mean, he was going all over Trump. They wanted, he asked if I would be off the record and uh, only talk about past inaugurations. Um, and at that point, Trump was getting ready to write his uh, first inaugural. It was just, he's not a history-minded person. In fact, he told me, I don't read history books. That blunt. Um, but he was curious, like, um, why Kennedy's speech is so celebrated, uh, you know, about Ronald Reagan's inaugural, about uh, William Henry Harrison's long inaugural versus short inaugurals. So that was the tone and tenor of a conversation of president elect he did say to me when i went to see him tell um the head of cnn um that, that he's a uh, you know he's he used a curse word uh he was very angry at cnn and then he said but and i'm a, you're a historian i'm not blaming you for what they everybody's done to me uh, but he had a chip on his shoulder about the network that i was the historian on but he did not have a chip with me and uh, I talked to him about sports, um, a little bit about, um, he was telling me he was amazed that the Utah um, Jazz NBA team, that he, he had misread that market, that, that he never thought an NBA team could function in as small as market as Salt Lake City, and he was wrong about that. 
And uh, I had seen a Miami Heat basketball game the night before with my son Johnny. Told him about seeing the Heat. So it was, it was um, you know, a very congenial kind of situation. Where was the meeting? Uh, Mar-a-Lago, we sat by the swimming pool there. And um, there were, uh, that day he had uh, CEOs of Mayo Clinic there, Cleveland Clinic, um, you know, other major uh, hospitals that he was meeting. So he would met, met with, they were all in a kind of a health talk room. And then he'd come out and he chatted with, uh, with myself and he'd go see them again. Then he'd come back again. Um, the, uh, the impresario of um, it was um, of interacting with me was Chris Ruddy of Newsmax, who was sort of the, you know, exp- explainer of what was happening there. Um, and so I used my time I, um, on that, and then I had two issues to raise with him. One, I was about national parks, um, and that I was wanted to alert him to the need for deferred payments, that our parks were dying, that they did not have the funds, that even Independence Hall had leaky roofs, and that one big thing that everybody could agree on is that our 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 shrines of our, our um, park system um, needed love and needed funding. So I threw that all at him. And and then I talked to him about my book I was writing, American Moonshot, John F. Kennedy and the Space Race. He seemed to like Kennedy quite a bit, thought Kennedy had street cred in his game still, that people cared about him. And he kept telling me that we're going to go back to the moon that uh, the moon is good for the American spirit. He was very bullish on Apollo 11 and what that uh, accomplishment uh, for the United States was. So I talked a little bit about space, and then I got ushered out. So how long were you there? Uh, a couple hours. Uh, but, you know, when I was there, we were like we are talking, he'd get up and meet the medical group and then come back. So, you know, it was... Um, was there something you saw up close that we can't see through the television lens? Um, he said a comment to me of um, uh, that was, uh, you know, he just thought that he wanted, he, I mentioned to him that Mar-a-Lago had used to be in the national park system, and then it was given away, and he bought it from the park. It used to be a historic site. And, uh, he, you know, he was telling me a lot of detail about that site, about how much it had there, but he kept stressing, it's boring now, it's boring here, it used to be, it isn't normally like this, and that it used to be this, vi- you know, vibrant place. I got the feeling he was getting used to the Secret Service, used to the the, the new Mar-a-Lago that was going to be under a microscope, um, but it was pretty normal, and I've done that with incoming presidents. Um, it got a little notice because it was Donald Trump and me talking to him, but I've talked to incoming presidents. Um, you know, it's a natural thing for did, a historian. Did, did he know n- nothing about inauguration speeches? Um, he told me that he was a person of the television age and that his history memory really was what began with kind of Jack Kennedy and uh, that he he watched so much of that that that's how he got his his um, news um, and his thoughts, how people looked on television um, all the way up until you know Kennedy onward, uh, but had no sense of uh, Lincoln's inaugurals or George Washington or any there there was no uh, historical memory or he didn't read about any of them. Keep in mind, he'd been busy, and so he was just getting to think about this. It, you know, there's a zillion things going on. He was just thinking about um, how does one come about doing an inaugural, how, the length, time, you know, what, you know. And at one point, when I did tell him, William Henry Harrison um, gave the longest, um, but he died a month later, you know, the famous story of him out in the cold, he, he asked me, how did an inaugural with a big crowd with no microphones did the word get around? How did it? I, I, I improvised. I said, I think they said, he said, <laughs> and it would you know, go all the way back. You know, he said, da, da, da. he said, yeah, that's probably how they, how they had to do it back then. Uh, meaning if you were way back and couldn't hear the, the, the words, uh, how did it get, get done? And I told him some speeches 
of that era, which you could read two different versions of what was said in newspapers because now they weren't perfectly transcribed like they are today. Did you see anything in his inaugural speech that you gave him? Oh, no. No, no one like that. No, no. I wasn't giving him ideas for it. Was there a re- I don't remember. Was there a reference to space? No. And it wasn't me. He was already uh, on space. I mean, he was... But did he being... follow through on space? He did. I, I, I think that my big concern was how would our country do the 50th anniversary of space? Uh, we, I thought we celebrated it quite admirably with documentaries, books, um, mem- you know, uh, intense memory of that moment because Armstrong walking on the moon is like the Kennedy assassination or 9-11. It's just this moment. And uh, I thought our country did a good job on that on the 50th. Now, going to the moon, uh, it's not about one administration. It has to continue. And I saw recently that the big contract NASA signed um, with SpaceX uh, to go back to the moon. Um, That's um, different than Bezos's Blue Origin. And so now NASA's in business with Musk. And a lot of that happened in the Trump years where, you know, um, Bezos became the enemy of Donald Trump, the Washington Post, Amazon, and Trump gravitated towards Musk. Um, he had a feud with Musk, Trump, but by, you know, year two in his presidency, he started backing. You could feel the backing more of giving Musk a chance. And when Trump ran for president in 2020, he was watching the takeoff at Cape Canaveral of Musk rocket going up. So um, I think the moon is pretty bipartisan. I think um, I know from ahead of NASA that Nancy Pelosi said if it's female astronauts, the Democrats, if they'd be the first women on the moon, um, then then I, Nancy Pelosi, would bring whatever power I have and of, you know, le- people in Congress to fund women going to the moon. And for NASA, and that was great. And even for Trump, that was great. There was this thought that if we go back to the moon, it should be women on the moon. And and I think that's bipartisan. I remember reading that early in 2017, at some point, you said, this is not an exact quote, Donald Trump's a disaster. Yeah. When did you decide that he was a disaster? On his inaugural day. And it wasn't the inaugural speech, which most people jumped on. I didn't like the way he went to CIA and started like um, um, doing this kind of um, loosey-goosey, weird talk presentation there, and then making a public fight that his crowd was bigger than Barack Obama's when all the evidence showed that it wasn't. That's somebody that's willing not to deal in reality as president. And remember, when Trump ran, he had used to be a Democrat. He used to give money to, you know, the, the Bill and Hillary Clinton are at his weddings. He was a populist of some billionaire populist. People weren't quite sure. But by the time he was insisting on this inaugural crowd size against empirical data uh, presented to him, um, I thought, wow, we're in trouble. And then he went right for the Muslim ban and used language as president that could be that was derogatory and um, and started uh, race baiting. We've known that about him from when he claimed Obama wasn't a um, born in America, the birther thing. But he did a kind of apology, a half hearted one about that Trump. There's a feeling that sometimes you run campaigns, but once the power of the presidency is upon you, um, you respond differently. And Trump did not. He stayed the same guy uh, that there was no, you know, uh, there was no filter. Uh, And they tried to with Kelly and chief of staff and all people were trying to contain him in some ways, but he was uncontainable. And he would admit that he's uncontainable. Explain this. Uh, For 30 years, the New York City media group promoted him day after day after day. New York Times, NBC, Tonight Show, all the networks constantly, the Larry King Show, they wanted to interview him. They wanted to act like this is an important guy. Are you going to run for president time and time again? Then you had 
the uh, the uh, the show that uh, Jeff Zucker produced for NBC. Apprentice. But they built him up and yeah. then spent all these four years tearing him down. Wouldn't you be angry? Um, well, that's you know at CNN we covered him early a lot. Uh, I remember, a lot. I remember being on air when he came to Alabama and had uh, Jeff Sessions support, and that was about it, Trump, from the Washington Senate crowd. And uh, it was covered like a major event, the Trump plane coming to Alabama, and this where all these other Republican candidates weren't getting that, the coverage. Um, and so, yes, because Trump is right about, it's about, in the news world, a lot's about ratings. And Trump was a ratings generator. He got eyeballs in the age of, he pioneered Twitter for that era he, he, um, as a, a communication form. He was, people talked about him nonstop. Uh, he had made profits for NBC. He, you know, I, and that matters in the media world. Once there became a fear, and I think the real turning point were in the debates. I think with the way Trump treated Hillary Clinton in the debates, uh, made a lot of people back off. For example, when Trump mocked the fact that she had to go to the bathroom, uh, or the fact that um, that he brought in Trump, uh, Bill Clinton, women who accused Bill Clinton of things, and flew them in there. It was, and then the Access Hollywood tape. At that moment, you started seeing a real backing off of him. Uh, and But even on election night, I think people presumed, I did not, uh, but people presumed that um, um, Trump was going to lose and that they would have made money on him and, on the running, uh, but then he would have lost and it would have uh, hurt the Republican Party. Um, you know, a lot of the media world is um, often, um, the, you know, they're looking for what's the shiny new thing. And Trump's had ups and downs. There are moments when he's on covers of magazines, then sinks back up, you know. And when he first ran, he seemed new and he got a lot of coverage, free media in 2016. But, you know, I, and I sound like I'm on his side. I don't really care. I just want to know why. I mean, day after day, CNN, MSNBC just pounded him, pounded him about Russia constantly. And in the end, what did we get out of it all? Yeah, but you know what, Brian? You can't listen to the noise. He did what you can't do. He did went, he went Nixon and kept enemies list and, and tried to beat the media culture. The great presidents learn to, again, you've got to operate above the media. Ronald Reagan was a conservative, but when he would, and they, Sam Donaldson would be screaming at him. And yet, you know, Reagan humanized Donaldson and he humanized the press, giving them coffee and donuts and, oh, how are you doing? And, you know, that style gets you further than this bombastic, you know, uh, uh, role where he set the media up as the enemy of the people. Once you do that, you're going to turn not just active journalists but former journalists. You're you're turning a you're turning the media world into you know the fourth estate into your enemy, and that means you're going to get punched a lot. And you why know, didn't he though get pummeled by Fox? And by Chris Ruddy, who, you know, set Fox this thing up. And Chris, uh, <laughs> Newsmax and Fox are, um, you know, a more conservative program. And they have a higher tolerance for Trump. Uh, many people at Fox and Newsmax, I think, were embarrassed by some Trump. And they applauded a lot of Trump. I mean, the problem with Donald Trump's his mouth. And he would say things that are going to be seen forever as um, racist and xenophobic and bigoted, and he's going to live with that. And it's hard when you're feed, saying the things that he said over and over. It makes for incredible play that day, but from a longer lens in history, you know, when we do these rankings and all the presidents, Trump on race is not getting a high mark. Do you think he believes that? Do you think he's a racist, or do you think this is an act in order to get the votes of the 74 million that voted for him? You know, I had, I think that the weirdness of his family background, the fact that his father got arrested at a Klan rally, and the fact that the Central Park, uh, you know, um, 
you know, full page ad he took out. Central uh, Park Five. Five, yeah. And, and the fact that he seems to, and then the fact that he claimed Obama wasn't a president. These are clearly a history going on here of a, of either deep racial insensitivity or he's racist. And it's, um, and it was a, you know, it's an albatross he's going to wear around his neck because he made too many, at that time of Charlottesville, he needed to have made it clear, and he didn't. He kept playing race games. I know, I don't know who David Duke is when you do, because he never wanted to lose those voters. And he saw correctly that there were a lot of white uh, resentment and dis, you know, enchantment out there. So there was a, a white working class, if you like, a rural white vote that had not been voting. They didn't think government was working for them, and he wanted those voters. He calculated that, and uh, when you go George Wallace or you go Strom Thurmond, you can go places, get votes, but you're going to be stigmatized because of it. What's the difference between sending that kind of a vibe out versus what the Biden administration is doing with saying we're no longer going to call people who come into the country illegally illegal aliens? Um, I don't know. Um, Look, I mean, the problem is with the border is just one of immigration is just a flashpoint problem of our day, Brian. I mean, nobody's having magic answers to it. Uh, Each side go is going back and forth. I mean, Biden is getting closer to what Trump was doing now, but then they won't. And then it'll be, you know, uh, I think the problem that Trump did is he made build the wall his big thing. We're going to build a wall. Well, he built a little bit of a wall. Uh, you know, I mean, if, if that's your big infrastructure, Dwight Eisenhower can build an entire interstate highway system in the 1950s, and you can't get some wall up on uh, the border, then you're, you're leading people down a rabbit hole. And the reason is because there are, people have property along the border, and there are easements that you've got to get, and there's law, environmental laws that you've got to process. So you just because you're president doesn't equal, mean instantly you can move into people's private property and do things. So the wall was going to be complicated, and he made it seem like it's easy, and Mexico was going to pay for it. And he found himself in a conundrum, um, but he had a ardent immigration policy and Biden is Biden's voters are you know it's a uh, you know one thing that's complicated on immigration Cesar Chavez the great Latino they have Cesar Chavez day in California Mexican American born in Yuma Arizona um, deeply Catholic did all of the United Farm Workers in the 60s and 70s and boycotts and of pesticides and wanted sanitary conditions, better education for people. Um, he was opposed to illegal immigration because he was building a union for Mexican American workers to get higher wages, not cheap labor coming over the border. That's Chavez even. So it's it's complicated when you're getting into those issues because sometimes a lot of Republicans in Texas, where I live, they want people coming over from Mexico to do landscaping and take these jobs and all of that. In many ways, Trump was angering a lot of GOP business leaders with his immigration policy. It wasn't just a right-left game going on here. Many Republicans count on the migration flow to take on jobs in Phoenix and Houston and the like. So uh, Trump was walking right into it with a big brag of building a wall with Mexico paying for it in it. In the end, I don't think Republicans are satisfied with the situation on the border, and I don't think Democrats are satisfied with it. It's still, we haven't come up with the same policy, and it might be technology will come in with new kinds of drone, new types of, um, you know, um, activity along the um, border that isn't as primitive as it is right now. Douglas Brinkley is an American historian and author. You can listen to more interviews with him by searching his name in the video library at cspan.org.